This is part one of the Java course and this is sort of like an introductory chapter where we get started with Java programming. But before we get started with the course, you need to keep all these things in mind. Number one, this course is published on YouTube in multiple parts. Each part is a chapter and targets one particular topic. And the link to the next chapter or the next part is in the description of each video. Number two, I'll keep this course up to date. If any of the content is outdated, I will remove that part from YouTube and replace it with the new one. So no matter when you're watching this, it has the latest and the greatest content. Number three, this is the very first course I've created. And since then, I've constantly updated this course with the latest content by making new videos. So you may see a mix of both old and new videos. The old ones may not be of the highest quality, may not be visually pleasing, but the content itself is of high value and is up to date. Number four, this course is actually a paid course on my website, but I'm making the same course available for free on YouTube. I hope that you stay committed to watching the course completely. It will benefit you in terms of applying for a software development role. Number five, YouTube is full of distractions. So I recommend that you watch in full screen and you don't have to learn from any other resources. This course has the most comprehensive curriculum and has everything you need to learn about Java. With that in mind, let's get started with Java, the most dominant programming language to ever exist. Welcome to Carparo and welcome to my course on Java Programming Masterclass, where you can learn complete end-to-end -end Java programming from scratch. This course is for you if you're planning to start your career as a software engineer or you want to clear Oracle Java certification exam, you want to build Android or dynamic web applications, you are a tester and you now want to move to development role, you are a passionate learner like me or for any other reason. Few highlights about this course. The course syllabus is inspired from some of the popular books as well as online courses plus my own experience in dealing with real-time projects. So you don't have to refer to any other books or online courses. You can just stick on to this course and you will learn everything. This course will cover complete end-to-end -end Java programming with over 200 plus concepts in 20 plus hours. And this also includes all the latest features of Java. Not to blame anyone or something, but I've checked some of the existing Java courses on YouTube. Some of them are even 10 hours long, but still, they're just covering few basics. They're not covering the entire syllabus. And I'm not even happy with the way things are explained or the syllabus that is covered. But this course will cover complete end-to-end -end Java programming. I've given a lot of emphasis to the topics that are crucial for interviews or to work on real-time projects. This is a must-take course if you're planning to become an Android developer or data engineer or software engineer or any such roles. But above all, I have the unique ability to teach very complex concepts in easy to understand manner by taking real world examples. You will know what I mean once you go through this course. This course has received loads of positive reviews from my students and some of them have seen some great results. They really make my day. Finally, before we proceed with the Java course, I'd like to share a few tips for your own benefit. Avoid distractions, especially if you're watching this on YouTube. YouTube will keep on recommending you some videos. Don't click them. If you click them, then you'll be lost into a different world altogether and you will lose track of this course. Stay focused. This course is like 20 hours long. Just dedicate one hour every day for next 20 days and you will learn the technology. Learn from beginning even if you know something about Java. If you know something about Java, you may tend to skip the initial few lectures. Don't do that. Start from scratch and you will benefit from this course. Watch the complete course without skipping any parts. Otherwise, I cannot assure any results. And once again, you don't have to refer any books or other courses. I wish you happy learning. But before you continue watching, do hit the subscribe button and click the bell icon. And also, 
do share this course with somebody who is willing to learn Java programming. It took me years to create this course, but I'm giving away for free of cost. All I'm asking you is to stay dedicated and watch this course completely for your own benefit. I sincerely hope that this course will help you excel in your career. So with that in mind, let's get started learning Java programming. I will see you in my next lecture. Let us try to understand where Java is used. I think it's easier to answer where Java is not used because there are so many things you can do with Java that we simply cannot list everything in here. But I'll try to list a few of them. Java is the most popular option for creating enterprise web applications. If you're wondering what is a web application, assuming that you're a beginner, then a web application is something that runs on a browser and can be accessed by multiple users across the globe over the internet. Some of the examples are like flight booking system or a banking application or maybe an e-commerce website, etc. They all fall under the category of web applications and Java clearly is the market leader in creating web applications, especially some of the financial management applications where security is the utmost priority, like banking application, for example, where you need to perform secure transactions. Java is used for creating Android applications as well. 80% of the smartphone market is Android and majority of those apps are developed using Java programming. Java is also one of the popular choice for creating standalone applications. Some of the examples are like you have Notepad or Photoshop or some audio editing software like Audacity etc. Java is one of the popular choices for creating standalone applications like that, although C++ is also one of the popular choices. Java is also used inside embedded devices like remote control, TV setup boxes, etc. And with the Java 9 module system, things have become much easier, which makes Java even more compatible with embedded devices. All the C++ is primarily used for game development, Java is nonetheless, it comes next to C++. And one of the popular games that I know of and that is developed using Java is Minecraft. And obviously, majority of the games that you play on Android devices were actually developed using Java. Java is used in scientific applications as well. As you might know, for scientific applications, performance and speed are primary concerns. And Java perfectly fits into that groove. Java is also used in automated teller machines. When you withdraw cash from the ATM, the system would make sure that it will deduct that much amount from your account before dispensing the cash and even send you an SMS regarding the same. Well, that logic is written using Java. Java has a huge market share in big data segment as well. Some of the popular tools that are developed using Java are we have Hadoop, Hive, Spark, etc. Without these tools, there is no question of performing analytics. Although R language is the popular choice for machine learning and performing data analytics, Java is nonetheless is also one of the popular options. Java also has some pretty good libraries to support machine learning and data science and to perform things like data mining, data analytics, predictive modeling, etc. Java literally left no stone untouched and it has also gained traction in IoT segment as well. So if you learn C++, then your career options might be limited to game development or creating standalone applications. Or if you learn R language, then your career options could be limited to data mining or data analytics. But if you learn Java, you have all these career options. And for that reason, as per the data from Indeed and Glassdoor, Java has the most number of job openings than any other technology. And this is as per the medium.com statistics. The demand of Java among all other programming languages is the highest. And the average salary for Java developer in USA is around $102,000, which is 77% higher than the average salaries. Java is secure, robust, reliable, dynamic and scalable language which will make it the best choice 
for developing enterprise web and mobile applications. Some of the popular global investment banks like Goldman Sachs, Citigroup, Barclays, Standard Chartered and other banks use Java. Android takes about 82% of the smartphone market worldwide and Java is the official language of choice for developing Android apps. Here are some of the popular websites that are developed using Java. We have LinkedIn.com. We also have AWS.Amazon.com. I'm not sure if you're aware of AWS, but this is a huge project and the entire AWS application is developed and powered by Java. Similarly, we got other popular websites like AliExpress.com. We got IRCTC.co.in, eBay, Best Buy, OpenCart, etc. So the million dollar question, what is Java? The simple answer would be, Java is a programming language and a computing platform. So what exactly does that mean? Let us first understand what platform is. Let's say you bought a new computer and as a friend of yours, I give you a few softwares and games. I give you one Photoshop, Chrome browser and Need for Speed racing game. Would you be able to install these softwares or play games? No, because your software does not know your computer and your computer does not know your softwares. They both are strangers to each other. Now we need to somehow introduce both these strangers to each other and develop friendship between them so that we can play games. So we need to hire a guy who does that job. Any guesses? He's none other than the operating system like Windows or Linux. So if you see Operating system is acting as a platform on which we can run applications or play games. Now I hope that you got some idea on what platform is. So just as operating system is there to run applications like Photoshop, NFS and Chrome, Java platform is there to run Java programs or Java applications. Except Java platform is installed on operating system just as any other software. And this is the very reason why Java is said to be portable. We'll talk about portability later. Remember, I said Java is also a programming language. These Java applications must have been developed using Java programming language. So depending on the context, you need to determine what Java is. Java is a platform on which you can run Java programs or applications developed using Java programming language. Now let us take a look at some of the categories of programming language. We have high level programming language. These are somewhat closer to human readable language and are hence easy to learn and easy to code. Most of the high level languages are portable or platform independent, which means you can write your program once and run it anywhere without having to worry about the operating system on which you're running your code. One setback though is that high level languages are relatively slower compared to low level languages. One major reason is due to the conversion process which converts the code that you write to the code that machine can understand. This process abstracts a lot of low-level details for the convenience of the programmer. This would be minimal in case of low-level language. So more the language is closer to human natural language, the slower it becomes. C++, Java, PHP are some of the examples of high-level language. Coming to low-level language, these are somewhat closer to machine language, I mean zeros and ones, and hence humans find it difficult to understand and to code. These languages are often dependent on platform. So the developer have to keep in mind on which operating system he is really willing to run his program. So if he writes a piece of code for Windows, there is no guarantee that it runs on Linux. Developers have to amend the code to get it working for all operating systems. And since these languages are close to machine readable language and mile away from humans, they run faster compared to high level languages. Assembly language is one good example and middle level language lies in between high level language and low level language and are neither close to human nor computer. They stay in between the two. A good example would be C language. Although you can write code which is somewhat closer to human readable language, you can also access memory using pointers or you can even write assembly level code using C. 
You must be glad that Java is considered as high level language though. Let us spend a couple of minutes knowing the history of Java. I'm not going to spend a lot of time in this as it does not really help us in any way except for interviews. So here is a quick history of Java. It all started in 1991 by a small team called the Green Team from Sun Microsystems. James Gosling along with his team members had a vision to create a language which is architecture neutral or platform independent language that can be embedded into electronic devices like microwave, remote control, etc. This would certainly help some set of programmers who write code for electronic devices. But in the meanwhile, there was a huge demand for the platform independence even for internet applications because internet was booming by that time. So now obviously all that green team had to do is to say goodbye to a small set of programmers for electronic devices and say hello to web developers. Since then, Java started advertising itself as Vora, which means write once, run anywhere. And obviously this has attracted a lot of frustrated programmers and contributors. In 1995, Java was first made available to public. The main intention was to get a direct feedback from programmers and general public. Later, in 1996, Sun released the first official version of Java, JDK 1.0, stands for Java Development Kit, which has all the tools and libraries essential for programmers to start developing Java applications. And they made it available for all major operating systems. Since then, Java continuously evolved release by release along with industry demands and requirements. In each release, they fixed the bugs in its early release as well as they introduced some new features. The following is the release history. So if you notice, from release 1.2 to release 5.0, the name changed from JDK to Java to Standard Edition or J2SE in short. And from release 6 to 8, it's simply Java SE. Now, although we can spend some time in knowing the features introduced in each one of these releases, I feel it's not worth the time as we have a lot of good concepts to cover. Let's preserve our brain for some interesting concepts which will come shortly. Let us take a look at one equation in math. A equals 10, B equals 20, C equals A plus B. What's the value of C? Did you say 30? Okay, well done. You really deserve a standing ovation. Now one more question for you in computer language. Did you get anything? You probably wouldn't. I just asked you if A equals 5 and B equals 5 and C equals A plus B. What is the value of C? The answer is 10. You may find it impossible to read and understand, but it's very easy for a computer to understand. And it's mere impossible for a human to remember and code hundreds of combinations of zeros and ones just to write a small tiny piece of program. So we need to solve this problem and eliminate the trouble to write a program in pure computer language. Now how about introducing a translator between you and the computer? So that you write your code like this and the translator will translate it for computer to this. And the translator in programming world, we call it compiler. So the compiler takes the input of a source file which has your source code in high level language and it will generate an object file which has numericals and characters in special in some weird sequence. For us, object file may look weird but it makes perfect sense for a computer and as we know computer processors understand only zeros and ones you need to have a c compiler to compile a c program you need to have a c++ compiler to compile a c++ program similarly we need java compiler to compile a java program or java source file let's take an example 
Let's say you wrote the following program in a file and you saved it. Let's call it a source file as it has the source code in it. In this program, we want to display the result of x plus y on your computer screen. Now this code has few bugs in it. The compiler will start the scanning and translate the source code to machine code from first instruction which is x equals 10. And then it goes to line number 2 which is y equals 20. And then it reads a display z. The letter z comes as a surprise for the compiler. Because until this point, it read variable x and variable y and know nothing about z. As the compiler did not read the line number 4 yet where value of z is calculated. So compiler takes a note of this line number 3 and then it continues from line number 4. At line number 5 we have another bug. We are trying to display something that is not previously defined. Compiler takes a note of this bug as well and moves on and continues with line number 6. Now if you compile this program you don't get the output you're expecting. Instead you will see a message saying there are two bugs in your code please fix them before you before you compile once again so the programmer will fix the bug by removing line number 3 and 5 as they are not of any use anyways and he compiles the program once again now your computer will run it and show the output you're expecting it will be 30 and will be displayed on your screen so the compiler translates your source code in one go and notifies all the errors it finds in the end. Once the compiler certifies your code that it does not have any bugs in it, your computer will go ahead and run the program and display the output as 30. Okay, good. Now let's see how the same thing is done in case of interpreter. Let us take the same code. Unlike compiler where the program is compiled in one go and run in one go, interpreter translates the code line by line. Let me explain you what I mean. The first line says the value of x equals 10. Now the interpreter translates it to machine language and then machine will run it the very moment the interpreter translates it. The machine will not wait for the entire program to be translated. Each line will be run by machine the moment it is translated. So now line 1 is translated and is run by machine. Line 2 is translated and is run by machine. When it comes to line number 3, just as compiler got surprised of letter Z, interpreter 2 gets surprised and reports the error immediately and it won't further process the lines. So this time it asks the programmer to fix the bug, only then will it ever go to line number 4. Since this course is about Java, let's talk a little bit about Java compiler. In case of C language or any platform dependent language, the compiler would convert the source code directly to machine code that the computer processors can understand. But in case of Java, the compiler will convert the source code to an intermediate code that the Java virtual machine can understand. And JVM further uses some tools and utilities to convert the intermediate code to machine code that the native computer processor can understand and run. So you write your source code, it will then be compiled using Java compiler. This will generate an intermediate code that neither computer nor you can understand, but only a Java virtual machine can understand. You may wonder why we need to have intermediate code. I will answer it later. So until now, interpreter did not come to picture. Now let's say compiler did not find any bugs in your code. A utility called loader will load the intermediate code which is compiled to the Java virtual machine. Now the file is ready for interpreter to take. The interpreter will then read the first line translate it to machine code and then your computer will run it. Now it reads the second line, translate it to machine code and then your computer will run it. It keeps on running till the end of the file or first occurrence of error. We'll understand more about interpreter when we cover the concepts of runtime errors or exceptions. 
In some languages, the source code in high-level language will be interpreted, not compiled. In case of Java, interpreter will not handle the source file, but it will handle the compiled code or intermediate code. Just-in-time compiler. Now you will better understand what just-in-time compiler is. Let's have a small program. Here as you can see that we are having five statements or five lines of code, out of which three of them are redundant. The statement display z is written three times. The compiler will compile the code and generate intermediate code. Let's assume this is the intermediate code. Now when we run the program, the interpreter translates line by line and your computer runs them as and when it gets translated. But one interesting thing about this is that the computer will have to wait every time the interpreter translates each line. Whereas in case of compiler, there is no wait time as the computer will get the fully translated file in one go. In this scenario, although we cannot nullify the wait time, at least we can reduce some impact using technique called just-in-time compilation. The compiled code or intermediate code will go through the just-in-time compiler so that it will further optimize it. In this case, line 4, 5, 6 are redundant and just-in-time compiler will mark this code as redundant. So when the file gets interpreted, the interpreter will now know that the code in line number 4 is going to come again. So it stores the machine code of line number 4 somewhere in the computer memory. And whenever it comes across with the same piece of code again, it will simply tell the computer to run machine code directly without translating. So there is no retranslation of same code again. This phenomenon is called just-in-time compilation. And this will significantly improve the performance. In reality, just-in-time compiler and interpreter will go hand-in-hand in, hand in Java and use even more optimizing techniques to increase the performance. So just remember, both just-in-time compiler and interpreter will come into picture only when you run the program. Now I hope I made myself clear in explaining what compiler is, what interpreter is, what just-in-time compiler is. If you're still unclear about any of this, don't panic, it's very normal for beginners. Just try to view the video once again. If you still don't get it, in second time, no need to worry again. Just move on to my next videos and revisit this video later. Okay, we've been hearing terms like JDK, JVM, JRE, and there are dictionary of such words which kept annoying us. Now let's try to uncover a few of them. We've already talked about JVM and just-in-time compiler in our previous video. So I'm not going to talk about it again and waste your precious time. But one thing which I wish I should have mentioned you in my earlier video is JVM have multiple vendors. Sun Microsystems has their own version of JVM. Similarly, there are some other vendors who claim that their JVM is better than their competitors. So each JVM is different. Some may use interpreter, some may use compiler, and some may use both. So if you got people saying JVM uses only just-in-time compiler or only interpreter, they are all correct because each vendor is having their own implementation of JVM. Okay, let's move on. JRE stands for Java Runtime Environment. The word itself says it's a runtime environment which means JRE helps run the Java program or dotless file to be specific. JRE is actually a collection of few tools, utilities, runtime libraries and JVM which together help run the Java program. If you just want to play games or use Java applications, you just have to install JRE. But JRE does not let you develop any Java programs. For that, you need JDK stands for Java Development Kit. It has all the tools and utilities to help you write, debug, compile and run the Java program. 
you're already aware of one of the tools that JDK has, the Java compiler. It also has debugger which helps in detecting the bugs in your code and a few other useful utilities. It also has JRE for you to run the compiled program. So yes, if you install JDK, it comes with JRE. So you don't have to install JRE separately. Okay, that's it. Let's keep things simple for now as we are definitely going to uncover some of the interesting and annoying terminologies as and when we come across with them. It's time to install JDK on our computer so that we can start writing Java programs. Installing JDK is same as installing any other software. What are you waiting for? Go ahead and install JDK. Okay, relax. Let me help you out. Visit their official website. That's www.oracle.com. Click on this menu. Locate the downloads link. Click on it. There are quite a lot of softwares offered by Oracle, but the one that we're interested in is Java. From this list, we want to download Java JDK for developers. We don't want to download JRE, which is a runtime environment. And as we had discussed before, if you install JDK, it comes with JRE. So let's click on this. and then download JDK. I've already done that. I don't have to do it again. Once you have this executable, just double click it. You may get a prompt that looks something like this. Here is the installation directory. If you'd like to change it, you can change it but I would recommend you to just leave it to the default and click next. It's going to take a while, so let me pause the video and then get back. Okay, we have successfully installed JDK on our computer. You can just close now. And if you go to the installation directory, you should be able to see all these files. In our next lecture, we're going to write our first Java program. It's time for our first Java program. In this video, we'll write a Java program and run it. Let's take a look at the steps that we need to follow. Let me open up the notepad. Step one, write the source code on a text editor. Step 2. Save the source code as Java file. Step 3. Compile the source code and generate object code or intermediate code. Step 4. Run the program and display a message. Step 5. Get a sense of accomplishment. Okay, let's go step by step. Now, what I suggest you is don't just sit and watch me do this. Follow along and do exactly what I'm doing. This will help you even if you're an experienced Java programmer. So step number one, write the source code on a text editor. I'm using Windows operating system, so I'm going to be using Notepad for this purpose. If you're using any other operating system, you can use something similar to Notepad. So let's open up Notepad and write our source code. Class, first step, opening and closing brackets, public, static, void, main, and, and within the brackets, string, arcs
make sure that you take care of uppercase and lowercase letters. For example, if you type string with lowercase s, your program will not work. Just type exact same code. You don't have to try to understand this code, but just write it. System dot out dot print ln and then you give your message here. I'm going to be giving a p it's working. Now all we are doing from this program is we're trying to show a text. So when we execute this program we should see this string a p it's working. But before that, let's go to step number two. Save the source code as Java file. Let's do that. So what we have here is a source code. Now to save this file as Java file, we need to append .java at the end of the file name. So we go to file, save as, and type in first step .java. Make sure the name of the file is same as the name of the class. If you want to know why it has to be same, maybe the answer would be too advanced at this moment. But as a rule of thumb, always give your class name as file name. Let's save it in desktop. So we got our file created here. This is a Java file now. Let's move on. Step number three, compile the source code and generate object code or intermediate code. For this purpose, we're going to be using a tool called Java C, which is a Java compiler. This comes with JDK. So let's open Windows command processor by hitting Windows key and then letter R, and then type in CMD. Hit enter or press OK. Now let's navigate to the location where Java C tool is residing. So we go to cd is a command used to change the directory cd stands for chain directory and then we go to c program files java jdk and then we go to bin directory hit enter let me show you the tool that i've just talked about Let's run dir, which shows list of directories and files in the current directory. So we should see Java C here. So here it is, Java C.exe. Now we're going to be using that tool to compile our source code, which is in desktop. We type in Java C and then the absolute path of the java file which would be c users admin desktop first app dot java let's hit enter this should compile our source code and generate intermediate code let's verify if it has done that we see a new file generated this is nothing but the intermediate code that jvm can understand well, let's move on to step number four Run the program and display a message. For this purpose, we're going to be using another tool called Java. So Java is the name of the programming language. Java is the name of the technology. Java is the name of the platform. Java is also the name of the tool used in JDK. So don't get over confused. Let's go to command processor. Luckily, Java tool is residing in the same folder. So we don't have to navigate to some other directory. So I type in Java and then we need to specify the location of the class file by specifying class path. So that CP stands for class path and the location of the class file is desktop. So let's specify that. C users admin desktop. Now we specify the name of the file which would be first app you don't have to specify dot class here because the tool java is going to 
consider only class files. Now if we run this, we should see our message. It worked. We see the message EP, it's working. Let's go to step number five. Get a sense of accomplishment. I hope you're feeling so. Now I'm pretty sure that you might be having questions like what is this public? Why do we need to write so much of code just to display a simple message? Isn't there a single command that helps us compile and run together? For all such questions, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Java Vault. Now, every time you want to compile and run the program, you need to navigate to this bin directory in order to access these tools, Java C and Java. To ease our job a little bit, Windows operating system lets us configure path variable. Let me show you what I mean. You right click on computer, click on properties, and then you go to advanced system settings, click on environment variables, and then we're going to be specifying a new user variable, which would be path in capital letters and then the value of it is the directory where the java c and java tools are residing so that would be c program files java jdk 1.8.0 underscore 51 slash bin end with the semicolon and then click OK click OK click OK and then you can close this window now let's try to run this program this works obviously we're in bin directory now let's try to run the same program outside the bin directory so let's open up new command processor window Or type java hyphen cp for class path c users admin desktop and then first app cool we're seeing this message this would not have worked without setting the path variable so when we specify the word java or java c operating system tries to search this tool in the current directory which in this case would be admin. If it is not there, then it will refer to the path variable that we have just set. And whatever the path that we give in path variable, it will go and look into that particular directory. And hence, we got this tool working even though we are away from the bin directory. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. Please like and subscribe. The link to the next part of this course is in the description below. Also, if you want to learn Java with practice, with quizzes, assignments, coding puzzles and interview questions, I cannot do that on YouTube. So you need to take this course on my own website. The link is, again, is in the description below. I'll see you in the next part of this course.